Hello, I'm Eric Topol, Editor-in-Chief of Medscape, and today I'm really privileged to have uh, with me Adam Gasly, who is, uh, heads up the Neuroscience Imaging Center at University of California, San Francisco, and we're going to be talking about some of the really pioneering work uh, that Adam and his whole team has been doing. So first, let's go start with your background, Adam. I know you're a New Yorker mm -hmm. and a Bronx High School, yes, exactly. a Binghamton, and then you went on to uh, Mount Sinai MSTP program. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Berkeley. That was cognitive. Yeah, I had um, Penn in there. It was a long, oh, right. long run. So right. uh, neurology residency at Penn after MD PhD at UCSF, then Berkeley for a, a postdoc in, in human cognitive neuroscience, uh -huh. and then UCSF. Okay, and now you've been at UCSF not quite a decade. Right? A little bit over, just around a decade now, okay. a little bit over. And you've been doing some pretty interesting stuff, which we're going to get into. <laughs> sure. So I guess um, when you were doing your training, did you have any idea where you're going to wind up in terms of this, uh, you know, moving towards the whole use of video games to change medicine? No, that was <laughs> not in my agenda. Um, I always wanted to do both uh, research that helped inform our basic understanding of the brain, uh, but also to help people. So that was always like a vision, but as we all know, it's very hard to do both. Um, but in terms of using technology like video games as a therapeutic tool, that was nowhere on my horizon. Even over you know, 10 years ago when I joined UCSF, uh, that was not in my job pitch, you know, just not, nothing what, that What was your pitch at that time? Uh, well, my work at that time was uh, to integrate multiple different tools like uh, functional brain imaging, fMRI, EEG, and transcranial magnetic stimulation to manipulate neural networks and understand how uh, these complex interactions between brain areas underlied attention and memory, and really the interface of attention and memory. Um, and I pitched that uh, program to integrate across these tools and wound up publishing that uh, in Nature Neuroscience five years later. Uh, but that was my goals, was you know, very sort of more basic cognitive neuroscience to understand neural networks and also the aging brain. So using these different imaging modalities mm -hmm. to really kind of zoom in and understand networks. But exactly. then as a child, you were playing, what, Atari? Or what were you, what were you, what I was, were you into? I was Atari. It? You were that Atari. Was exactly and right. Were you really into it? I or? was into it. I was yeah. really into video games growing up. Uh, I remember sort of hacking them and reprogramming them with really? friends who all these holes in those early video games that actually was the most fun. Uh, Asteroids was the first game that I actually cleared. M many people do not know that you can actually win on Asteroids. Wow. It takes many, many hours, <laughs> and then it's just a sheet. Uh, but yeah, I always, I always liked video games. I think I had a dry spell on video games during med school, uh, you know, in residency, but um, it was always what, Was always it when your, your parents would tell you, Adam, no, you can't do this? They, or, they really or, didn't do that. No. Uh, yeah, we didn't watch a lot of television growing up, and okay. um, yeah, that was, you know, it was like when video games first appeared like that, I feel like no one really knew what they were for a little bit, so we had a reprieve to play them for ridiculous numbers of hours. All right, so now you're on the cutting edge of... Um, all the neuroimaging, you have this very, really interesting background, enhanced not just the neurology at Penn, but also the cognitive mm -hmm. background. And then what happens when you say, uh, I've got this eureka switch, almost like a phenotypic switch to get into video games as a therapy? How did that start? Well, uh, a lot of my research was focused on the aging brain and trying to really dissect what it is with healthy aging, so independent of things like Alzheimer's disease and other causes of dementia, what it is that leads to impairments in, in how we interact fluidly with the world around us as we get older. And we were finding that there was a burden of distraction and multitasking that everyone faces, but gets worse as we get older. And we really characterized the networks and the reason why that was occurring. And I started giving more and more talks uh, for the public. Actually, the AARP invited me to give a big keynote uh, to, uh, you know, obviously an older audience explaining what's happening in our brains as we get older. So you were trying to explain why everyone, uh, as you get older, their brains are rotting away. Exactly. And they wanted you to give a keynote for that? Okay. Because it, it was like memory and aging, and so like, wow, this will be interesting to our community. But you didn't have any treatment at no, that point, right? No, no. And okay. when you give a, a scientific talk about this topic and use all these really sophisticated imaging modalities, academics like, that's fascinating. But when you give a talk to a group of 
older adults that are not scientists, and then you end the talk with, that's what I got. That, you know, it's sort of like, you know, movie ends, everyone dies, credit rolls early, and it was like, that's not a really satisfying movie. No, I wouldn't think so. And I remember that feeling of, of looking at their faces and being like, wow, this is not how I want my story to end with the bad news. So that was like a sort of transition point of thinking beyond just uh, understanding the brain, but how we can actually use uh, new approaches to improve these very deficits that we were describing in the lab. So that was really the motivation, uh, was really through interacting with the public. But, but up until then, everybody's pushing all these different drugs. Mm -hmm. It's all a drug story. Yeah. And had anyone uh, really been enlightened to say, maybe we could use video games to do this? Not really. There was a, a emerging literature uh, in the early 2000s showing that uh, the first-person shooter video games, the action video games, if you looked at the young people that played them and brought them into a laboratory and uh, studied their cognitive abilities, especially cognitive control, uh, so attention, selective attention, resistant distraction, task switching, they were superior mm -hmm. compared to their peers that didn't play games. And if you took naive uh, younger adults and had them play, they also started showing improvements in these very abilities. These are the same abilities that we see declining with aging. Um, and I was, you know, as a neurologist, very frustrated with the tools that we had. Um, the medications uh, that we give are non-targeted, so we get side effects. They're non-personalized in terms of how we prescribe them, while the data is based on, you know, large populations. And so it's just very unsatisfying. Right. Um, and so I, I, you know, we did actually start some drug trials back then to see if it could help even these uh, science. You would look at imaging and the results exactly. of the drugs? Exactly, yeah. exactly, and, and look to see if we could change these abilities. So I actually did start in that world, the more traditional world. But um, I, what really drove me was trying to think of a way to activate the brain selectively. So you activate, you know, this, the underlying computational unit of our brain, the neural network, as opposed to neurotransmitters, which are going to be blunt uh, because they're all over the brain. And so thinking about how do we activate the brain selectively led me to the very tools that we use to study the brain selectively, which are these cognitive paradigms, these psychological tests. So the idea was, well, if we know that they activate the brain selectively, which makes sense, they're an experience and our brains respond selectively to experience, could we have them play essentially our tasks to activate them and then because the brain is plastic, even the older brain, it would learn how to do better. The problem is no one would ever do our tasks over any amount of time because they're incredibly boring. So that's what led to the sort of eureka moment of video games do that, right? They engage you in a challenge and they're immersive and engaging and fun so they lead to you know, deep uh, gameplay. And so that was the idea, uh, is really to use what we do in the lab already, which is design these tasks, but not in order to sample how the brain works, but in order to put pressure on the very systems that we're activating. So you, did you have to make a connect? Because you, you, you didn't make your own video games. Did you no. have a... Yeah, I, well, this is, again, this is why, you know, the, the fun of, of being alive and all these random events that can occur along your path. I happen to be really good friends uh, with a couple of guys from LucasArts, uh, Matt Omernick and Dimitri, and they uh, were just my buddies. And I was always in awe of what they did. They, they created Star Wars games. Mm. And they were really excited about the brain. Uh, mm. as most people are. And so we used to trade off. I went up to Skywalker Ranch and saw all the amazing production of a AAA video game, and they would come down to the lab and see what we do in terms of brain imaging. And we were always like, wow, it'd be fun to work together someday. But not until that moment when I was like, a video game, did, uh, did I think of reaching out and saying, hey, do you have any time uh, to volunteer into the lab because I had a design. So I actually had a design for this video game. It, oh, actually, okay. it actually came in a dream, which is sort of surreal but true. <laughs> Um, and I knew we couldn't build it in our lab, so I reached out to them and said, what do you think about this as an idea uh, to improve function of cognitive abilities in older adults using a custom designed video game that you'll help me build? And they were really excited about it. I, I remember Matt's first statement, he's like, I've been teaching teenagers how to kill aliens my entire life. I'm ready to use my skills for something different. <laughs> Now, so was, was, was this actually um, called Neuro Racer? Yep, that's the game Neuro Racer. And that was on the cover of Nature. Yeah. And that was kind of in 2013, so yep, that's like exactly. three years ago. Yeah. That was a kind of uh, signal that something's going on here because, it, you know, to have on Nature a yeah. video game for therapy, yeah. that was, you know, 
nothing nothing like that ever before so things really were taking off and now you were obviously not just talking to the science community you're talking even more to the public because you yeah. have a, a therapy but what I want to get at, at this point is you're doing all these trials you're right. actually doing the kinds of things that go to the FDA correct like as if it was a drug correct. And you have the potential to hit all these different neurologic conditions I see the list it includes like autism mm -hmm. Alzheimer's um, attention deficit mm -hmm. disorder uh, traumatic brain mm -hmm. injury I mean the list is really long mm -hmm. so where do you go where are you at now sure and, and where are you headed yeah, so, at, so we, we built that game, we did the study, it was published in Nature, as you said, and was really a pivot moment for us. Do we go back to the traditional, or do we take this, as you said, a signal that there's something here? Um, so two things really happened. I moved the game out of the laboratory into industry to scale it and do large studies. I've learned very clearly that you can build prototypes in an academic lab, but nothing that's going to really get into people's hands. And I wanted that to happen. And it's hard to get NIH grants for that stuff. It, and it is hard to get <laughs> NIH. We have NIH oh, grants, but, yeah. but not, you know, without much <laughs> much challenge. Um, and that's Achille? Is yeah, it? so Achille, is uh, a company? Achille Interactive is a company that I helped co-found. The folks from Lucas came over full time. Matt Omernick is our chief creative oh, officer. Oh. And um, it's part, it's uh, located in Boston and in Marin, right here in Northern California. And so we had this dream. I, I serve as a science advisor, keep my, my day job at the university. <laughs> and we had this dream of taking the engine behind Neuroracer into a game that was much more fun, uh, higher levels of music, art, and story, so that it was more engaging, and also uh, tighter closed loops, which are really the active ingredient in the game. And that's this very rapid updating based on your performance in real time. That's why our games are not normal video games, in that they're constantly reading out how accurate you are, how rapid you are, and then adjusting and scaling the difficulty in a totally personalized way to you. So you almost could think of it as a personal trainer. Mm -hmm. Every single second, pushing on these systems in a selective way as they get better through plasticity. And so th the company has now you know, a large team that has designed these closed loops in an even more intricate way than we did in Neuroracer. And the decision was made, actually, interestingly enough, a polarizing decision to not just put the game out there in the consumer market, but to lock it down for clinical trials, which has been going on, and you mentioned all of them. I'm really just an they, advisor. Are, are, actually, all these trials are going? Right? All those trials really? are going. Really? Oh, yes. wow. All those trials are going. So, uh, wh not, which is the one furthest along? So the ADHD study yielded really exciting mm. pilot data. Um, but there's interesting uh, uh, preliminary data in depression and uh, PTSD uh, so and autism. And Alzheimer's. <laughs> so actually, they all have interesting data. And wow. some of these are just as of days ago. That's why I was pausing. Yeah, yeah. But the ADHD uh, population and clinical challenge was identified as the first target. Um, there is almost 100% in surveys have been done of parents that would consider a non pharmaceutical alternative uh, for their children mm -hmm. that have been diagnosed. Awfully popular. With a, it is. So um, the need was felt to be very great. And so that has left sort of the laboratory or mechanistic feasibility clinical phase and entered a full approval trial, multi-site trial, hundreds and hundreds of children for a clinical indication of ADHD treatment. And this is true randomized where there's a control group that oh, doesn't yeah. get the game? It, they get something else. It is, it is in every way. The classic trial. It's a drug trial, gotcha. except it's gotcha. a video game and not a pill. Wow. But uh, that was the goal. The goal was to play by the current set of rules. Um, you know, it is a challenge in, in a lot of ways to the incumbent system. So we said we will do it exactly the same way. And then once things progress, I, I, I think, you know, we're all uh, aware that this needs to be some changes in the system. Games, <laughs> games iterate, uh, unlike drugs in a different way. And so there's many, many different things. Well, you know, a lot of the, um, certainly the Medscape audience, uh, doctors in general, don't appreciate how big the gaming world really is, uh, right? I mean, massive. this it's massive. Is, uh, it's just bigger than the movie industry and the music industry put together. Yeah, I mean, in it's the just US. It's beyond belief, really. Yeah, it's completely global. 50-50 male, female. Uh, many, many older adults play. The, the average gamer is pretty close to 40 years old now. Uh, so, and it's just going to increase. You know, it's, it's the most powerful form of interactive uh, media. And so, 
in itself, it's already uh, a strong influencer of behavior. But if you could design in a very careful way, at a very high level way, and then validate in a high level way, then you're creating something new. Well, I, I particularly um, I admire not only that you're doing your randomized trials, you're going to the FDA, you didn't have to do that. Yeah. But also, I guess you've done neuroimaging to see the actual yeah. effects, so you're really getting to the science yeah. of the DNA. So it's really fantastic. Yeah, so that's, we're, we're still neuroscientists, our lab. <laughs> you know, so we build many other games. So what's happened is that game, NeuroRacer, has left the lab now. And Achille is working on these large validation trials to try to essentially create the first prescribable video games as, as therapeutics. In the lab, we're now incubating new games. That's where I enjoy working the most, is coming up with the design for the game that challenges a, a certain neural system, and then bringing on professionals, and we have our own internal game team now, and so we have multiple games, and then do, do a deep Do you dive. wait for your dreams for these designs? No, or? unfortunately I have not dreamed another game. I, okay. I wish I had. Um, and then and then we do the deepest dive ever into figuring out yeah. what they change. Wow. So from MRI, structural and functional, EEG, we do stress testing, uh, we do uh, obviously extensive cognitive battery, and now blood work looking at inflammatory markers and hormones and epigenetic changes. So if it can change, we are monitoring yeah, it's it. It's fascinating. Now I want to get your read on, while you've been doing this stuff in a kind of high science way, there's this other brain food game, yeah. Lumosity and all these others. Right. What are your thoughts about those? Do they do anything? Well, you know, the, the whole field is built on a solid foundation, that our brains are plastic, that they can modify in response to experience. So that's why this all can happen in the first place, is that there is that strong basis in, in plasticity. However, not everything we do for our brains are going to be equally effective or even good just mm -hmm. like not everything you put in your mouth is going to be equally good for your body and so and, and video games are also a massive category unlike not unlike drugs or food there's many many different types so the the foundation is good but you can't just build something and say because the brain is plastic this is going to help your memory right so the challenge is to not just build but also to validate and treat it very seriously to know who it's working on, what are the ideal doses. Um, and that really hasn't been done uh, to the degree that we needed to. And, and that's what you see in the marketplace yeah. is this confusion oh, gosh, now yeah. with the consumers and regulatory agencies, and if it's not the FDA, it's the FTC, and people are like, what's going on here? And so my mission is to slow it down and say, there's something real here. We see the signals in our lab, but still we're even, I don't even say anything more than we have a signal enough reason to look more deeply and to be very rigorous about it. But that's, that's what we have to do now. All right, terrific, Adam. This has been a really nice review of what you've been doing. Such exciting stuff. And I want to thank all of you uh, for uh, your attention to our discussion and a, a really fascinating one-on-one uh, -on -one, uh, interview with Adam to learn about how video games can change uh, neuroplasticity. Uh, and so thanks for joining us, and we'll continue to bring some of the most interesting people in medicine uh, to Medscape.